Association. So welcome. Um, thank you all for a wonderful UMA conference and also welcome to State History, the State Historical Society Conference. We're so excited that they're combined this year. Um, so uh, let's see, so little housekeeping things. We, we hope you stay for the afternoon sessions and have a wonderful time. Um, we'd like to give a special thanks to our session volunteers. We appreciate you making sure all the AV is working correctly and the presenters have what they need. So thank you for those people doing that. Um, also, please remember to fill out your conference survey. There's only one. We've got QR codes scattered all over the place. So you can scan that and that would be wonderful. So it's also for the history conference. We've just got the one. Um, also, we would love for you down, to go down to the South Lobby and visit the Better Days booth. They have some hexagons there that you can fill out, the, fill in the blank, Utah women are. These hexagons will be turned into a quilt that will accompany Martha Hughes Cannon's statue to Washington, D.C. So make sure you check that out. Then for the Utah Museums Association, we gratefully acknowledge our supporters. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. The Utah Division of Arts and Museums, Utah Division of State History, Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks, Taylor Andrew Audiovisual. Thank you for your incredible AV assistance recording sessions like this one. Utah Humanities, the Utah Cultural Alliance, Church History Department, the Heritage Museum of Layton, Process Curiosity, This is the Place Heritage Park, VR Wizards, Better Days. So thank you for that. And now I'll turn the time over to Jennifer Ortiz with State History. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Diana. And we so appreciate partnering with the Utah Museums Association this week. Um, I want to give a huge special shout out to our administrative teams through Ruth White, Alicia Rowley, Veronica Solana Arangure, who without their amazing coordinating skills today would not be possible. So quick round of applause, please, for the, our team. I want to officially welcome you all to the 70th annual history conference before we kick off today's incredible keynote with Dr. Greg smoke. Uh, I wanted to share just a few updates about our team with you all. So um, for those new friends and old friends, I wanted to remind folks that we are the Utah Division of State History and we have a legacy of 125 years as the Utah Historical Society. We're part of a larger department under the Department of Cultural and Community Engagement and are proud to share this umbrella with eight other divisions such as Indian Affairs, Arts and Museums, State Library, just to name a few. In addition to our existing staff, we are delighted to share some new faces and names that have recently joined our team. In May, Monique Davila started as our new Community Engagement Coordinator, who is working on behalf of the Peoples of Utah Revisited Initiative. In June, our Administrative Assistant, yeah, yeah I'm clapping for everyone, I love it. Um, in June, our Administrative Assistant, Veronica Solano Arangure, joined our team. And finally, in September, we were delighted to bring on Dr. Catherine Kitterman, our newest public historian who will lead our Women's History Initiative. Uh, Peoples of Utah is a major, and excuse me, Peoples of Utah Revisited is a major initiative. It's our flagship America 250 project for our agency and sets to widen the lens of Utah's historical narrative and amplify minoritized voices from Utah's past and present. Um, I wanted to just do a quick shout out on all of the tables here in today's room. You should have a flyer that looks a little like this with a uh, scannable QR code. We are launching our scholarship portion of this project. And this is a, a project that's going to take us into 2026, um, but we'll be doing two uh, virtual sessions to help share information about um, upcoming opportunities to get involved with the project of doing original research and scholarship, again, to help uh, widen the breadth and depth of Utah's history. 
Uh, as some of you may have heard this morning, we are finalizing our strategic planning process with the goal of adopting a new strategic plan by January of 2023. We've traveled the state hosting community listening sessions, surveying community members, and have had feedback from all 29 counties in the state, which I have to just applaud our staff and our administrative team. That's a huge accomplishment. Um, our strategic plan will help guide our organization for the next five years through 2027. Um, through amazing transitions and change, such as um, the Museum of Utah. I'm going to skip that slide really quick and go back, um, which is a huge uh, opportunity for us to help expand Utah's narrative, but also have a presence on the Utah Capitol campus. So some of you may have heard this project. It is going up um, at, in the North Capitol part of the Capitol campus in Salt Lake City. Um, the building that's currently there is coming down, and it is going to reside on the the first three floors, including the garden level, which will house our history and arts collection of the state. It's an amazing project and we are thrilled to be a part of it. And then finally, um, our collections are on the move. I know some of you have asked about the Rio Grande building and we are finally getting out of the building so they can do some earthquake mit mitigation and retrofitting of the Rio Grande. We are finalizing that and have just for a few fun facts have moved over 3000 nitrate negatives, 30,000 fragile books, 96 pallets of manuscripts, and over 1.5 million photographic images, just to name a few. Um, a huge lift. Our collections team, part of them are here today, and I just want to applaud all of the work that they've done as well. So that was a whirlwind, but I do want to invite now um, our board chair, Molly Cannon, to help introduce our keynote today. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon. I am honored to be here with you sharing in this wonderful joint event. I too want to thank some of and recognize our conference underwriters. As we all know, these conferences cannot proceed without the hard work and support of, of many organizations. So we'd like to thank the Utah Humanities, Utah Museums Association, Church History Department, and the Department of Cultural and Community Engagement. We appreciate their generous contributions. Uh, please join me in thanking them once again. I also want to take just a moment to recognize the the heavy work that our staff and volunteers uh, do to make these conferences such a success. So please join me in thanking them as well. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Gregory Smoke. Dr. Smoke is the director of the American West Center and Associate Professor of History at the University of Utah. He specializes in American Indian, American Western, environmental, and public history. He completed his master's degree at the Northern Arizona University and his doctoral degree at the University of Utah. He taught at Colorado State University and the University of Minnesota. We know him as the editor of Western Lands, Western Voices, essays on the public history in the American West, and as the author of Ghost Dances and Identity, Prophetic Religion in American Indian Ethnogenesis in the 19th Century, as well as his forthcoming environmental history of the Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument. Greg's association with the American West Center began in 1988 and has included projects with the Shoshone Bannock tribes, the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, the Big Sandy Rancheria of Western Mono Indians, the Navajo Nation, Nevada Indian Commission, and the Utah Division of Indian Affairs. He's the past president of the National Council on Public History and has served on numerous committees for professional organizations, including the National Council on Public History, the Organization of American Historians and the Western History Association. 
please join me in welcoming Dr. Greg Smoke for our keynote, The Confluence of Water, History, and the Public in Utah. Here is your advanced first job. All right, thank you so much, Molly. And thanks to everybody here. This is a big room, um, quite impressive. Um, hopefully, most of you will still be here by the time I'm finished talking. Um, <clears throat> I am sometimes long-winded, so I'm going to spend a lot of this time reading directly from my computer rather than just doing it off the cuff, because if that's happened, we'll be here a couple of hours. But again, this has been a great run with Think Water Utah, and um, this is sort of the culmination of that multi-year effort so i've been so proud to be part of and you'll hear a lot about it you've already heard a lot about it today you'll hear about it in other sessions um, i'm sure so i'm just going to jump right in and oops yeah this works and just say in utah of late it seems that water has been both everywhere and nowhere at once for the past two decades, our state and the rest of the American West has been locked in a mega drought, the, reason, the region's worst in 1,200 years. At the same time, unprecedented population growth and the, and the increasingly impossible to ignore impacts of climate change have pushed the West toward the brink. Um, the crisis on the Colorado River portends both painful cutbacks for water users and decades of legal and political battles to come. Meanwhile, declining water levels on Great Salt Lake threaten air quality and human health for most of Utah's population, in addition to the, its impact on migratory birds, brine shrimp, and the other species that depend on the lake's ecosystem. That's the nowhere part. The everywhere part is the awareness of the water crisis in the media and in the public consciousness. Once a local or regional story, the West disappearing water has become a, a story of national, even global interest. The New York Times, the Washington Post, The Guardian, and CNN, among many others, have covered the crisis. HBO's John Oliver even made water a subject of a recent episode of his show last week tonight. And if you saw that one, you know, Utah didn't come off looking too good. So everywhere, it seems, alarm bells are finally sounding. And so the context for this talk today is the project that's been going on for three years, Think Water Utah. Um, and in that context, I have found all of this alternately horrifying and sometimes gratifying. As a citizen who cares deeply about the U as cares deeply about Utah in the West, I am worried about our future. We live in a time when both the validity of science and the meaning of history are under attack. Neither trend bodes well for dealing effectively with our uncertain water future. Yet at the same time, as a publicly engaged historian, I remain hopeful that my work and the work of so many others on projects like Think Water Utah will benefit our community by contributing to public discussions as we face such consequential decisions. Now, when I say that, I'm not suggesting that history provides an objective roadmap for the future. We've all heard the saying, right? Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Well, in fact, historians are notoriously bad at predicting the future. And so despite living in Utah for over three decades, I will make no claim to being a prophet. No historian should. And so what then is the role of a historian at the confluence of water and the public? This is the underlying question of what I want to, want to address today. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the next paragraph. I'm going to talk about the Think Water Utah project, but I think you heard a lot about this already today, and you're going to hear more. But just thanks to all of the folks who worked on this. It was a, a great um, team. I might note that um, Megan Van Frank has lovingly called it the water circus, and that the big top of the water circus will be coming down this Saturday in Monticello with the closing of the H2O Today exhibit. So after three years of planning and two years on the road, or three total years. But now to return to that central question, what is the role of history and the historian? Um, if historians make poor profits, we can provide useful historical context 
and hopefully spur public discussion. In public facing projects like Think Water Utah, our central goal is to provoke visitors and readers. And I use the term provoke advisedly. In doing so, I'm following the late great Freeman Tilden, the National Park Service's guru of interpretation, who so many years ago asserted that provocation was the chief aim of public interpretation. Effective interpretation, he wrote, served to stimulate the reader or hear towards a, towards a desire to widen the horizon of interest and knowledge and to gain an understanding of the greater truths that lie beneath any statement of fact." Unquote. So to provoke then, we're not trying to pick a fight by retelling well-known stories with a critical eye toward their meaning in light of current concerns. Um, we are not trying to tear down heroes or heritage, but rather to deepen and complicate the story and get our visitors and readers to stop and think more deeply about the past as context. And so going into this project, we knew that if Think Water Utah was truly to have meaning, we must ask hard questions and tell difficult stories. And so what I wanna do then is think about this project as I, I've been rethinking, you know, thinking it's over and over about this as um, <laughs> I got prepared for this and I started thinking, how do I summarize all of this? And so I want to try to talk about some intertwined historical threads that I believe provide particularly valuable context. And they're linked by a central notion that water is life, but water is also power. And so there's an oft-repeated adage, popularly though falsely attributed to Mark Twain, that, the wet, and that in the West, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. It's a funny line, like this postcard but it also gets to a deeper truth. In arid places like the West, water is power. The general scarcity of water meant that in the relatively few places where it was abundant, such as the Wasatch Oasis Zone, where we are today, um, these places became the focus of intensive and permanent Euro-American colonization first. And this set the stage for the dispossession and deportation of native peoples. Like the struggle to control, later the struggle to control water meant, difference, meant the difference between success or failure for those colonists, whether they be farmers, ranchers, miners, and even whole communities. Now, while water is intensely political in the West, in Utah, it is also central to cultural identity, for water figures prominently in the LDS faith's cherished narrative of hardship, trial, and triumph. You know, the idea of making the desert blossom like a rose. The whole story is, of course, far more complicated. And in many ways, it is a story of conflicts, laws, and power. The more complete story begins with an understanding of human cultures and how they interact with the environment and how different this can be. Um, these differences have often engendered conflict and almost always resulted in very different impacts on the landscape. Now, the central difference between native and European waterways came down to adjustment, to adaptation. More precisely, who or what was expected to adapt or change. For the native peoples of Utah, their approach might be summarized as one of adaptation to the arid environment. For, for example, numic speaking peoples, Utes, Shoshones, Goshutes, and Paiutes adapted to the natural possibilities of their homelands and made optimal use made optimal use of resources without attempting to re-engineer the world around them. Although their motivations might differ, both Mormon and non-Mormon colonists approached the arid lands of the West in similar ways that were quite different from native peoples. For these newcomers, it was not a matter of adapting to nature, but a matter of changing nature, bending it to fit to the best of their ability, their desired out to the best of their ability to their desired outcome. At the most fundamental level, their actions found religious sanction in the Judeo-Christian belief that humankind had been given dominion over nature. The idea that transforming nature was both good and necessary. By the mid-19th century, for other various economic, political, and religious reasons, Euro-Americans sought to transplant and sustain an agrarian way of life they knew in the humid East. This meant adapting to the arid West only as far as necessary and then searching for ways to transform nature to overcome its limitations. And this is still true today. 
Oops, I missed a slide. As Euro-Americans first traversed and then colonized the land we today call Utah, water became a source of early conflict. Overland immigrants and their livestock traveled along narrow corridors that followed streams or linked springs and other water sources. The inevitable result was overgrazing, the depletion of game and firewood, and fouled waters. The Shoshone peoples of the Great Basin, living closest to the trails, felt the greatest impact. In most cases, Euro-Americans co-opted, and the most, or in many cases, the Euro-Americans co-opted the most important water sources. Now, the arrival of the Pioneer Company of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1847 initiated changes of a far different magnitude. Unlike the other overland immigrants, the Mormons intended to stay, and the Wasatch Oasis presented their only real opportunity to build a communal agrar agrarian society between the Rocky Mountains and California. Despite church policies aimed at preventing conflict, the relentless expansion of Mormon settlements came at the expense of native peoples and native lands. Um, the initial LDS settlement in the Salt Lake Valley was peaceful, largely because it was a meeting ground rather than a year round home for native peoples. And I wanna point out, this does not mean it was unclaimed. It does not mean it was not native ground. Um, but these, the conflicts over land and water intensified, particularly over the rich and well-watered lands of Utah Valley, where we are today. In the 1850s, a series of, of wars marked the beginning of two decades of intermittent conflict that forced removal of Ute people from the Wasatch Oasis and central Utah. Meanwhile, to the north, LDS settlers expanded into the Cache Valley homeland of the Shoshones. Tensions there would eventually cul culminate in the Bear River Massacre of January 1863, the largest mass murder of Native peoples ever in the American West. And though not directly involved in the killing, Mormon settlers surely benefited um, from that event, that horrific event, and cast the slaughter as inevitable. And so we're getting, so getting these stories here of power of conflict. And while they were resting control of Native waters, um, rest, resting control over Native waters, um, the LDS Church engaged in another power struggle over water, this one with other Euro-Americans. In leading the exodus to Utah, Brigham Young hoped to build an autonomous, self-sufficient society with minimal dependence on outsiders or outside influence. Control of water was an essential part of these plans. This struggle, however, would not play out on the battlefield, but largely in the arena of law. Into the 1880s, territorial laws worked to preserve local, that is, Mormon control over water. And now at the risk of putting you all to sleep, just a very brief primer on water law in the United States, because it's, it's just so central to this argument, right? Now, water law in the U.S. was rooted in British, in the British water, no, excuse me, Water law in the United States is initially rooted in the British common law idea of riparian rights. If someone owned land along a river or a stream, they held a right to use to reasonably use its waters, provided they did not diminish that resource for others. This doctrine was well suited to the humid east, where, like the British Isles, ample rainfall meant farmers did not divert water to their fields. In the West, however, a different standard took, took root the doctrine known as prior appropriation. It rests on two principles, first in time, first in right, and beneficial use. Water rights were not tied to land ownership, but rather depended on establishing an official claim or priority date. Those with earlier priority dates possess superior and um, use rights to those with claims on the same stream or source. The location of the right holder's property or the place of the diversion does not matter. It's the date. Um, the doctrine also rests, though, on this requirement for action, and this is where beneficial use comes into play. Under prior appropriation, water is still considered a community resource, not exactly private property. It is the right to use a specified amount of water. Right holders, whether they be individuals, corporations, or municipalities, must prove up their claim by putting the water to use. And if you fail to do so, you run the risk of losing that. And that's why prior appropriations often just this idea of beneficial use is known as use it or lose it. And this has a real important, real important implications for the way we use water. And in a session just before this, um, Darren Perry brought that up, 
right, of the, his neighbor who's going to water his alfalfa um, incessantly because there's a fear that if I don't use that water, I will lose that water. Now, for LDS settlers, however, religious ideals led to specific settlement patterns and served to delay the impl implementation of prior appropriation in Utah. At a time when other Euro-Americans embraced capitalism and individual homesteads, the saints, brought, the saints sought to recreate the communitarian values they saw in the compact settlement of early New England towns. Water law was part of this. Land could be privately owned, but water could not. As communities and cooperative irrigation work sprang, sprang up along the Wasatch Front, local church leaders administered water rights, not according to priority dates, but according to established needs and, perce and the perceived worthiness of the individual. As federal presence in Utah increased, the church moved to decentralize water control, less federally appointed officials intervene in the process. Water and timber resources came under the purview of county courts in 1852, while the 1865 law that provided for the organization of, of self-governing irrigation districts included provisions to prevent outside investment and outside influence. Yet, over time, the powerful appeal of Gilded Age individual capitalism grew, in, even in Utah. And in 1880, the territory legislature repealed the 1852 statute that charged um, and charged county water commissioners with recording water rights and determining superior and inferior rights based on seniority. By 1903, which is a surprisingly late date, Utah enacted its first water code and prior appropriation was the law of the land. Now, while early LDS attempts to hold the outside world at bay through the control of water were ultimately unsuccessful, they provided partial inspiration for the alternative vision of Western development proposed by Major John Wesley Powell. Now, despite the pitfalls of inherent in doing great man history, Powell is a useful figure in reaching public audiences, in provoking public audiences. That is because he holds a central place in the public imagination, particularly in Utah and among segments of the outdoor community. Today, Powell is thought of as a bold explorer, the man who lost an arm at Shiloh in the American Civil War, but still led two expeditions through the wildest and most remote river canyons in the West. Many river runners, and I'm certainly one of those, um, have come to view him as a kind of godfather of the sport. But more importantly, and for my purpose here today, they also tend to project our modern understandings of the natural world on him. Powell was neither a modern environmentalist, nor a champion of free-flowing rivers. And so there's value in considering what he was and what he was not, and more importantly, thinking about alternate visions for Western development. Now, Powell was not a reckless adventurer. He was an ambitious 19th century man of science. He was largely self-taught and broadly interested in the natural and the social sciences. He reflected an earlier era of scientific endeavor, for he held no college degree and he refused to specialize. Um, he followed his broad curiosity into seemingly unrelated fields. His expeditions garnered him fame and launched a long career in federal service during which he collected, documented, and studied the natural history and human cultures of the American West. Remarkably, for 13 years, he directed both the US Geological Survey and the Bureau of American Ethnology. And while geology and anthropology seem incongruous today, his interests were part of the same cloth of national expansion. As a scientist, he wanted a rational understanding of the land and its peoples, right? So they're not that far apart, really. Um, he is perhaps best understood as a 19th century forerunner of progressive era conservationists. Like them, he believed that resources should be used for human development, and anticipating the 20th century emphasis on scientific management, he called for Americans to take science seriously. We still don't. <laughs> Although, as Darren pointed out earlier, too, science is not the whole answer. Um, we'll, get to, we'll get to that a little bit later. Now, rational planning and careful stewardship might be employed to make Western development possible, he argued. But, and this is the important part, he always said, within the limits imposed by nature. Now, Powell clearly saw the link between nature and nature, water, and power in the West, but he's also motivated by a cultural 
imperative. It was central to his goal of sustaining a vision of agrarian, American agrarian democracy that was rooted in the thinking of Thomas Jefferson and other members of the founding generation. For Jefferson, economic dependence brought subservience, and conversely, economic independence begat political independence. Economic began political independence. The surest way to sustain the, the, the republic, he believed, was to ensure a broad landowning middle class made up of petty capitalist yeoman farmers. And I love this, venerate the plow. Um, that's basically the message, right? Now, in the decades before the Civil War, this vision, ironically proposed by a wealthy enslaver, became the unifying ethos, ethos of Northerners who believed that the expansion of the slave power posed the greatest threat to free labor and free men. While being raised in an abolitionist household, Powell also imbibed this broader strain of anti-slavery thought. And thus he went to war both to end the enslavement of human beings and to sustain this utopian vision of American um, economic democracy. Now the Civil War saw both the high watermark for this ideology as well as government interventions to, be, to achieve that vision. With Southerners absent from Congress, landmark legislation in, was passed that it was intended to remake the nation in this idealized image of the freeholding North. These laws included the Pacific Railway Act, the Morrell Act, and the law that more than any other embodied the Jeffersonian ideal of a freeholding middle class, the Homestead Act. Right? The Homestead Act was intended for nothing less than to give Americans their stake in economic democracy. Now, Powell went to war to defend these ideals. Um, but as the nation moved west, he worried that the numbers simply would not add up. That was because of an obstacle even more daunting than the institution of slavery, the environment itself. In most places west of the 100th meridian, um, less than 20 inches of rain fall in any given year. And this prevents the kind of non-irrigated agriculture that was possible farther east. A 160-acre homestead that might provide a respectable living in the humid Midwest made little sense in the arid West, where smaller, more intensively irrigated farms or much larger tracts devoted to grazing were more logical adaptations to the environment. And so how could Americans sustain an idealized agrarian democracy as they move from the damp eastern soils from which it emerged into the parched lands of the American West? This was the question that provoked Powell's most important work. And in answering it, he proposed, he proposed a radically different way of dividing the waters and colonizing the land. Now, during his expeditions, Powell spent considerable time in Utah. And although LDS colonists were driven by a different agrarian vision, their experience in ir irrigating the arid West became one of his principal examples. As I outlined earlier, the initial Mormon colonization of Utah was guided by the desire to establish an autonomous communitarian society. Powell did not share the same concern with isolation and autonomy, but he did want to restrain corporate interests and prevent the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a few. Thus, local control was essential to his plan, and that is why Mormon laws and communitarian development provided important examples. Now, Powell presented his plan for the American West, which Wallace Stegner deemed a blueprint for a dry land democracy, beginning with his 1878 report on the lands of the arid region of the United States. It also includes one of the great visuals that is used in um, the Waterways essay, and we've used throughout the Think Water Utah project, that colorful map, which is a, a visual rendering of, of reimagining what the West might be. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Right? Now, unlike booster visions of unlimited growth, Powell's blueprint reflected understandings of environmental realities. He estimated that only 3% of the West could be successfully irrigated. That was his estimate, 3%. Today, there are about 1.2 million acres under irrigation in Utah. That's roughly 2% of Utah's land area. Still, even at 3%, this meant bringing 100 million acres under irrigation to provide homesteads for a million or more American families. It would be a monumental task demanding careful planning and enormous amounts of money and, energy, uh, money and labor. It would also require the application of technology to utilize every drop of the region's scant water. 
that the West Rivers should, indeed must be tamed, was not a question for Powell. He wrote in one of his late last articles in Century Magazine, quote, conquered rivers are better servants than wild clouds. Like his contemporaries, he believed that water resources should be fully developed. So, quote, no water runs to the sea. The free flowing rivers that we treasure today, what we so treasure today, were a waste. Progressive era conservationists like Theodore Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot would take the same view. But there are important differences between Powell and these men. He did not envision or desire federal management by experts, as later progressives would. The government, he thought, should provide the infrastructure and the technical assistance, but the ultimate management of the resource must be left up to the actual residents, preventing the concentration of economic power and sustaining the, the cherished vision of agrarian democracy. Now, this interaction between the natural world and political ideals is at the heart of Powell's alternative viewpoint for the West. Um, most importantly, it entailed a redrawing of the arid West political boundaries to, ally, to align with natural watersheds. Our current state, county, and township boundaries were drawn mostly on straight lines of the um, imaginary survey grid. They divide watersheds and make conflicts over water rights inevitable. Now, in the American West, that has meant a handful of big, squarish states. More effectively, Powell thought, those states should be replaced by 200 or more watershed units, what Powell called natural districts. And that's what you're seeing on this map, are the major watersheds and the watersheds within them, right? In these districts, prior appropriation would be set aside in favor of a hybrid doctrine of water allocation. Water rights would be attached to land ownership, but unlike riparian doctrine, the quality and the location of the land would be central considerations. I won't go into the details that I was about to, but he basically divided these watershed districts up into three different classes, and the best lands would get and keep all the water. Those best, best lands would be the higher lands near the headwaters that could be irrigated very effectively. He suggested only 80 acres of farm, right? And a, a, a raft of other ideas that were meant to, again, recreate this idea of an of agrarian democracy. Now, ever the rational scientist, Powell's first step in reordering Western settlement and water rights along these lines would be a comprehensive irrigation survey of the region. With the initial support of powerful Western senators like, like Nevada's um, William Stewart, who in truth, hope the project would facilitate rapid and unfettered development, Congress funded the Irrigation Survey in 1888, and Powell got to work. But most Wests did not want to hear Powell's message of natural limitations and democratic control. Stewart and other Western boosters quickly concluded that Powell's survey would not advance their plans. And after only two years, Congress cut funding for the survey, effectively dashing Powell's vision. Now, the ascendance of a different technocratic capitalist vision for the West was on full display in Los Angeles, California in October of 1893, when Powell spoke about water in public for the final time. And I'm kind of trying to emulate Powell today in that. Um, Powell was there as the honored guest of the Second National Irrigation Congress. The gathering was the brainchild of William Ellsworth Smythe, who published Irrigation Age in his adopted hometown of Salt Lake City. The attendees were largely a mix of boosters, developers, and government officials. Powell delivered his keynote on Friday the 13th, perhaps an omen. He began by avowing his commitment not to the railroads or other great enterprises, but to, quote, a system that will develop the greatest number of cottage homes for the people. I am more interested in the home and the cradle than I am in the bank counter. Whether they truly agreed with such populist sentiments or not, the developers and boosters in the room applauded along with the men who did share Powell's vision. As he continued his address, however, the mood in the room quickly turned um, from, from warm reverence for the Civil War hero and audacious explorer to outright hostility. The grumbling started when Powell called out the folly of ignoring nature. And I'm going to read you this whole quote because I think it's, it's pretty amazing how powerful this is. He said, Now, what I wish to make clear to you is this, there is not enough water. 
to irrigate all the lands. And when all the rivers are used and when all the creeks and the ravines and when all the brooks and when all the springs are used and when all the reservoirs along the streams are used and when all the canyon waters are taken up, when all the artesian wells are taken up, when all the wells sunk or dug that can be dug in this area and region, there is still not sufficient water to irrigate this region. Do I make that clear? There is but a small portion of the irrigable land which can be irrigated when all the water, every drop of water is utilized, unquote. Yeah, wonder what he was thinking. He then issued a prescient warning. He said, as years go by, the interest in these water rights will swiftly increase. I tell you, gentlemen, you are piling up a heritage of conflict and litigation over water rights, for there is not sufficient water to supply these lands. By this point, it became difficult for Powell to continue his speech. Some men booed while others assailed Powell with questions and counter evidence. Frederick Newell, Powell's subordinate at the USGS, who had become the first director of the Reclamation Service, wired the home office that, quote, the whole crowd jumped on him for some general statements. The Mexican dele delegate said he liked that. It was the only bullfight he had yet seen in this country, unquote. A year later, Powell resigned as director of the USGS, and he would never speak in public on water again. Again, my, my, my goal after today. So if you start throwing things or heckling me, it would be much appreciated. Now, now the delegates to the Irrigation Congress um, would stand no talk of limitations, limitations. They embraced a vision of unlimited expansion and prosperity. They also shared in the growing faith that technology would overcome any natural limitations, that humankind could engineer itself out of any bind, what we might call the cult of the engineer. While technology undoubtedly can and has improved our existence, for some problems, there just aren't technical fixes. Now, this brings me to the dominant place of urban water demands in Utah and the American West. By the way, that's Salt Lake City in 1910. If you notice the smog, it's pretty amazing, that photo. Um, the dominant place of urban water. Right? Now, Powell, of course, was envisioning Western water development, nurturing an agrarian democracy. But by the late 19th century and through the 20th century, cities exert their power in the struggle to control water. This should not come as a surprise for the West and ha always has been an urban place. And today the West is the most urban region of the United States. About 81% of Americans live in places defined urban, while in the West, over 90% of citizens live in urban areas. And while about 80% of the water used in Utah still goes to agriculture to this day, urban growth accounts for the greatest increase in demand and has led to technologically complex incredibly costly and environmentally, potentially environmentally detrimental proposals to meet current and projected demands. And so I'm gonna leave Utah and I'm gonna to go to California for an example, right? If we go back to that day in 1893, when Powell gave his fateful final speech, one of the men in the audience who stood in protest was William J. Mulholland. Then the superintendent of the privately held Los Angeles Water Company and later the head of the Los Angeles Department of Water Power, which today remains the largest municipal utility in the United States. In rebutting Powell, Mulholland shouted, quote, in the Owens Valley during the month of July, 500,000 inches of water run to waste and not one inch was used for irrigation. That might be true. But Mulholland was not really interested in irrigation. His focus was on, on the current and more accurately, the future needs of the budding metropolis he called home. His comments suggest that his sites were already site set on the waters of the Owens Valley as a solution to Los Angeles' looming water crisis. When the Irrigation Congress met there in 1893, Los Angeles was in the midst of explosive growth. Its population increased 350% in the previous decade. Right? It was on its way to um, surpassing San Francisco as the largest city in, the, in California in the American West. Right? Um, yet despite its rapid growth and great promise, the city's, the city's water system still reflected its roots as a Spanish and Mexican farming community. The city's main water source was the Los Angeles River, a small trickle of a stream that periodically became a raging torrent. The city was running up, and the city was running up as the city was running up against natural limits. 
without more water, its growth might falter. This predicament precipitated the most infamous water grab in American history, the struggle that pitted the metropolis against rural farmers and the democratic ideals of reclamation against the political power of the urban West. Now, the target of Los Angeles was the Owens Valley, where the Owens River dries this, this, the drier eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada, and it made irrigation, irrigated agriculture viable in the high desert. Like the other rivers of the Great Basin, the waters of the Owens never reach the sea, but flow into an eponymously named Terminal Lake, in a sense, a smaller version of our own Great Salt Lake system. About a decade after the Mormon pioneers had colonized the Salt Lake and Utah Valleys, other Euro-Americans displaced indigenous Mono Paiute peoples and began farming in the, Ohio, in the Owens Valley. Because of the area's natural advantages, it became the site of the Reclamation Service's first planned project in California. But Mulholland and Fred Eaton had different plans for the valley. Eaton was a native uh, Los Angeleno. Um, he had served once as city engineer and was elected mayor in 1898. He first conceived of the Owens Valley Aqueduct. Mulholland was his protege, who at first was skeptical, but later came to believe it was the only solution to sustain the city's growth. Together, the men began to secretly require, acquire water rights in the Owens Valley with the assistance of Joseph B. Lippincott, the reclamation official in charge of the Owens Valley project. You talk about a stunning conflict of interest. Right? Um, meanwhile, um, Eaton and Mulholland magnified the threat of a water shortage to rally voters behind bond issues, to purchase more water rights, and then to fund the aqueduct. In fact, the water was not yet necessary for Los Angeles, and essentially would be stored in the aquifer of the soon-to-be-annexed San Fernando Valley. Now, these pieces were coming together by 1906, but because the aqueduct would cross federal lands, it could not be built without federal approval. In July, Senator Frank Flint of California pleaded Los Angeles' case before President Theodore Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot, the president's old friend and confidant, who was director of the, of the United States Forest Service, was a principal architect of early federal conservation policy. Pinchot's view on utilitarian conservation was well known and summed up in his own words. Conservation was the, the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest time. Very utilitarian point of view. It did not take Roosevelt long to deem the water more valuable to Los Angeles and better used there. The decision doomed the Owens Valley project, and follow, in the following year, the Reclamation Division pulled the plug. Lippincott, though, landed on his feet. He resigned from the, the Reclamation Service, and he became Mulholland's deputy at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Now, and you know, somebody should make a movie out of this, maybe with Jack Nicholson in it. Yeah. Um, now, Mulholland saw, oversaw nearly every detail of the aqueduct's construction between 1908 and 1913. When it was complete, it carried water 233 miles across the Mojave Desert. It included 50 miles of tunnel, and it used 23 siphons to overcome ridges and canyons. So there's no electrical power powering. It's all the pressure of the water falling, right? It was a technological marvel, but it did not impress the residents of the Owens Valley, nor did it slake Los Angeles' thirst. Despite Mulholland's promise to divert only the water necessary, drought conditions in the 1920s led him to the conclusion, the conclusion that he must divert it all in order to preserve the city's water right. The decision spelled doom for the valley farmers and small towns, and they fought back. Between 1924 and 1927, a water war, a literal water war took place. Vigilantes dynamited the aqueduct on many occasions, forcing the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power to patrol the line with armed deputies. Now, while the conflict did end in 1927, Los Angeles' Los relentless growth and quest for more water did not. The aqueduct was extended to the Mono Lake Basin, which became depleted and threatened that famous and fragile lake. In the 1930s, an even longer aqueduct was constructed to pump water from the Colorado River to a dozen cities in Southern California. And today, the massive California aqueduct system transports water some 600 miles from its ultimate source on, at Lake Oroville on the, federal, on, on the Feather River to Los Angeles, 600 miles. In Los Angeles and throughout the American West, development has begun more development. Increasing supply has always nearly meant increasing demand. 
Now the environmental impacts of this are most telling for Utahns. Today, it's the fate of Owens Lake. Um, by 1970, Los Angeles had completed a second Owens Valley pipeline and began pumping more surface water and groundwater out of the valley. The result was environmental devastation. Once a refuge for migratory birds, such as just like Great Salt Lake, Owens Lake became a completely dry playa. Winds whipped up toxic dust storms that plagued the valley's small communities. Legal actions have resulted in more recent mandates to restore flows into Owens Lake, but the lake remains mostly dry. And so the dust laced with cadmium and arsenic, among others, um, elements continues to fly. Now the parallels between Owens Lake and our own Great Salt Lake are hard to ignore. There are, of course, important differences. For example, the, dust, the toxic dust storms whipped up from Owens Lake impact a much smaller number of people in, small, in high desert communities such as Lone Pine, Keeler, and Ridgecrest. But a shrinking Great Salt Lake threatens millions of people living along the Wasatch Front. That's a, pro that's a frightening proposition, but it also offers maybe a, a bizarre glimmer of hope. Los Angeles' development came at the expense of those small communities hundreds of miles away. Along the Wasatch Front, we are essentially doing this to ourselves. And that may take, that may perhaps hold the key to change. There is power in numbers. And if Utahns um, have the, the will, we might find a sustainable way forward. There are no easy answers. We cannot stop growth, but we can manage growth more efficiently and effectively. We can prioritize conservation over developing greater water supplies that have the effect of encouraging even more growth and thus greater demand. These are not easy decisions and they won't happen overnight, but my hope is that projects like Think Water Utah encourage open and meaningful discussion of our future and inform public decision making. And so that's where I'm gonna end. Um, there's much more I could say, but I've gone on too long already. See, I wrote that in here because I knew I would. I'm not going to close with a summary to tell you what it all means, because that wasn't my goal today, right? My hope was to provoke you in a good way, right? Um, to get you to stop and reconsider our relationship to water and to each other. And ultimately, that is the role of a public historian at the confluence of water and the public. So thanks for listening. Are those on? Let's see. Okay. Uh, we, we'd like to invite questions from the audience for Dr. Smoke. There is a microphone here. Um, because this is a recorded session, we do need you to come up to the microphone to ask your question. And there's also a microphone over here um, on, um, I'm completely turned around. I have no idea which directions these are, but to the right and to the left. So please, are there questions from the audience? Yes, come on over here to the to the microphone. And then I'll just yeah. Can you speak to the um, the Lake Powell pipeline and where the water really comes from? Well, wow, that's a lot of one. See, there is not a technological fix for any of this. Um, the Lake Powell pipeline is a great example. You know, it's what I was getting at using the Owens Valley example and in, in to some measure, right? So the water would be drawn from Lake Powell, which of course we know as it, when I began researching this, or, or when I wrote this up last week, I looked to see what the level of Lake Powell was at. It's at 24% capacity. It's 169 feet below full pool. That means 169 feet below where it would be if the lake was full. 
that's at the dam, right? Um, but the idea of growth and the idea of a technological solution for it is often illusory. Just as when Mulholland and Fred Eaton and others built these massive systems to supply Los Angeles with water, it didn't slake the thirst. Um, you know, the position of the Water Conservancy District in Washington County is that this is a necessary project to provide a workable and um, reliable water system for the people that are there. Great, but it also means that more people are going to be there, right? And that's going, I don't see an end to that. One of the, the, the most stunning statistics that I'll throw out there is that the population of Washington County has increased 13 fold in the last 50 years, right? There are about 14,000 people in St. George and around St. George in 1970. By 2020, there were 180,000. The Chem Gardner Policy Institute on the University of Utah's campus predicts that the population of Washington County will be over half a million in the next 30 years, right? So you continue to see you know, that growth. And so the Lake Powell pipeline is that same mentality that there's a, there's a, a technical solution to this. And again, I think that what you need to do is, is look towards conservation. But you know, the amenity communities that exist in places like that are built on golf courses and lawns and all kinds of things that, that people want, but they also wanna live essentially in one of the driest corner, the driest corner of the state of Utah. There I am being a prophet. Thank you again for sharing all of this for what must be three years now. Um, my question is um, in regards to recreation activities, not only on um, the rivers, but the lakes on down um, to that potential pipeline, how do you see um, those folks either helping or hindering what you're, what you're provoking us to do today? Well, I think that if, if people, I think recreationists, and I'm going to speak, I mean, there's different kinds of recreations, right? There's power boaters who are interested in having full reservoirs. Um, so they can boat and water ski. Um, there are skiers who are interested in um, a more sustainable snowpack. And, you know, the, the decline of Great Salt Lake, it's, it impacts the ski industry in, in more ways than one. It's not just about lake effect being reduced. It also means that dust in the air lands on snow and it means it melts faster. And so it shortens that season. Um, river runners, of course, want full streams and it's in the spring. Um, so, you know, I think that, I said this earlier in the session, I think that it's kind of cynical, but I do believe that um, the solution is gonna come when people feel the personal impact. And I think that all of those communities have already felt that impact. And I think that it's gonna get even more intense as everyone does, right? Not just the dust on their cars, but when their kids start coughing because they, they have respiratory ailments because of the dust. Um, I think that that will eventually um, drive the change. But I think it, it often does start with people in the outdoor community who often see themselves as environmentalists. I'm disappointed no one has booed me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is, first of all, thank you for giving that detailed history. Um, it helps understanding a lot, as well as the effort, the mutual effort that we all have to conserve water. Um, listening to the history of water and conservation of water in the state and the LDS institution's involvement in it throughout the years, my question is, what are is, is the LDS system doing things to conserve the water as well? I don't know that I can answer that question from say the, the, the church's perspective, not being a member of the church. However, I will say this, there was a semi weird article in um, the Guardian, and then people saw this where it said that, that there was this Mormon imperative to have green lawns. And this was something in Utah that led to a lot of water use. 
And in fact, I don't see it as a Utah or a Mormon thing. I see it as an um, American thing, as a United States thing. And so I think it's somewhat misplaced to say, you know, what they did was go back to that idea of making the desert blossom like the rose, right? And so that puts the pressure on green grass. But that's, it's just simply not limited to the Mormon population. And this was, this struck me the other day in the Washington Post. I was reading about Kalinga, California. You know what's going on in Kalinga? They're about to run out of water completely, right? completely out of water and the mayor refused he's the only one in the city council who voted against a ban on watering the front lawns and he said if you go up to sacramento they have green grass at the state capitol they can have green grass why can't we and i thought well yeah so this is it's a, i think it's a broader issue than um here i think that um you know the point being that that um you know, LDS faith has has a has that old tie to water, because you were talking about people who come from the humid east who then immediately set about irrigating, and they have to, and they learn by trial and error, and it becomes part of that cherished mythology. And I've said this many times. I think so many people, especially people who live outside of Utah. Um, they just think Mormons are really weird and they think Mormon history is going to be really weird and different. But I always point out, you no, know, the pioneer generation are largely ninth, they're 19th century Americans. And the values, the, their perspective that they bring with them, right? It's going to be shaped by their faith, but it's also largely what other 19th century Americans wanted to do and what, the, what they saw in nature. Amy Van Huss also has a microphone on that side of the room. So there are questions from remote there. There she is. All right, I'm gonna do the mic drop. Well, thank you, Greg, again, for your presentation today. Uh, can I, can we, oh, one more question. Uh oh, the last one's always, oh God. I did not want to be yeah, the last yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trouble rolled in. <laughs> Actually, I asked this in a session earlier, but you you mentioned we are uh, the population center. Seventy five percent of Utah lives along the Wasatch Front. Um, that's that's strikingly different than what happened in Owens Lake, and there does seem to be um, a swell of interest among people in power to save the Great Salt Lake and understand um, water. I'm wondering, I have two questions because uh, there was a great point that was made in the last session in response to this question. Um, is there another example that you know of where a lake was, a terminal lake was saved or a saline lake was saved globally because of that fact, there's a population center or are we unique? And then the second question is, what are the power structures? Because the response to this question was agriculture, right? And that's a huge percentage of, of water use. What are the power structures that exist um, in this state that are going to argue for more impact on the population in, in the name of using water? Hmm. Well, to answer the first question, I can't think of one, right? I don't know of any um, lake that has been saved where there's a large population next to it. Owens Lake is the one you see a lot in the news. The, the, the worst example globally is, of course, the Aral Sea. Um, in, in Central Asia, formerly part of the Soviet Union, that was completely dewatered for a, a massive um, cotton irrigation project starting in the 1950s and um, is slowly coming back. But it was the largest saline lake on earth, I think, second. Um, so I can't think of another example. As for the power structure, um, it's going to be tricky. I think that there's going to be a lot of um, the leaders of Utah aren't going to touch that third rail that is agriculture. My concern, though, is even if you do, and even if you transfer all that water to the cities, that's going to hit and create that same dynamic that we see in Los Angeles or we see in St. George, where more people move in and then there's more demand again. And it's this vicious cycle. I see that happening 
you know, over and over again. As a historian, I'm not going to be up here and talk about cycles of history and pretend things occur over and over and over again in some sequence. But in terms of what has happened before, that would be my concern. So I think what those leaders need to do is really press conservation. And we need to think about cultural changes. Right? Do we need green grass because they have it at the state capitol? Right? Do we need to, to have particular things or do we accept where we live and make our lives here, embracing the place where we live? Right? So um, again, I can always cop out and just say, I can't predict the future, so. Thank you. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for Dr. Smoke. And as you uh, travel to your afternoon sessions, I'd just like to invite you to find the book vendors and the exhibitors um, and, and uh, the book publishers, I believe, are here. So uh, please check those out on your, on your route. And I look forward to our conversations this afternoon in the sessions. Thank you.